Hello and good day and welcome to today's special briefing on the regular SAGE session. And as you have seen in the announcement, we have lots of different topics to cover. So again, just to stress, this is not one of the special briefings we had recently on any one of the vaccines. This is the regular SAGE briefing and we will have um, uh, quite some topics to look at. The meeting itself, the SAGE meeting was held from last Monday, 22 um, March to Thursday, 25 March. Um, and it took some time to get all the recommendations together. Hence, we have the briefing today. And as you know, we had some other announcement just recently. Um, with this, let me welcome our guests today on the panel. As you already know them anyway, uh, we first and foremost have uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Alejandro Cavioto, the chair of the strategic advisory group of experts on immunization. Thank you very much for joining us, um, Professor. We have Dr. Joachim Hombach, the executive secretary to the SAGE from WHO. And we have Dr. Kate O'Brien, the director of the Department of Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals here at WHO. My name is Christian Lindmeyer. Um, the way we go about is the usual, we'll hear uh, introductory remarks and we'll go through all the various um, topics uh, step by step and we'll then start taking questions. Please raise your hands on the raise your hand icon and we'll try to get all your questions answered. With this, thank you very much and let me give the floor to Professor Kavioto. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, we had a very interesting uh, SAGE meeting this past week, as, as Christian said, and I will go over the main recommendations that came out of that meeting. The first thing we um, reviewed were the vaccines against Ebola disease. This is particularly important because we have a new outbreak going on in West Africa that needs uh, to use the vaccines that are available. And for that, we needed to go back to our recommendations to see that they were totally correct to, for the purpose. So in that sense, we have recommended that we can use in the outbreak the two licensed vaccines, the one produced by Merck and the one produced by Johnson & Johnson in the way that they have been approved, but with the uh, off-label use to make sure that everybody from infants to people who are seven years, 17 years of age and older can be vaccinated. This is based on a risk analysis and the previous experience with these vaccines in the outbreak, uh, the previous outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have also recommended that all pregnant women and lactating women should be vaccinated, also according to our experience, even if, if this is an off-label juice. We don't recommend for now that we use these vaccines because of the shortage we have for them uh, as a preventive way we feel that this is something that will need to be analyzed in a much different way. So we have asked uh, our working group that you looks into these vaccines to come up with a learning agenda on how we can use the, the two vaccines preventively. And we have the good news that uh, Gavi will be paying for a stockpile of these vaccines that will be then made available in cases both of outbreaks and for preventive use. In the case of polio, we have some um, news that were worrying the situation of the circulation of the wild polio virus still going on in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and the um, increase in the outbreaks due to the polio derived, uh, uh, the vaccine derived poliovirus 2, which have increased not only in Asia, uh, in Africa, but also in Asia with inclusion now of Tajikistan. On the positive side, we have a new injected polio vaccine that has been pre-qualified. This is based not on the Salk, but on the saving virus, which is a, a good thing for the containment process. And uh, we now have enough supply to be able to give every child that needs it a second dose of this IPV vaccine as has been recommended before. Uh, this is good news also because Gavi has accepted to pay for the second dose of vaccine in the countries that they support. So in that sense, we are moving on with the, with the, with the program. 
In the case of the new oral uh, poliovirus vaccine against the poliovirus type 2, which is has been developed and pre-qualified and uh, given an EUL approval, uh, mainly to use during the, the outbreaks of uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses too in the different parts of the world. We have the news that it has finally been implemented in Nigeria for the first time, and that means that it will soon be used in other parts of the world where it's needed. For the time being, our recommendation is that in the case of these outbreaks, countries should use any oral vaccine that they have available to be able to contain them. Um, in the case of the COVID vaccines, which of course uh, were one of the other main uh, themes that we went through it during the meeting, uh, we heard for the first time publicly from the two Chinese companies producing uh, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, Sinopharm and uh, Sinovac, and we were able then to see the advance that they have made in the process of determining both the safety and the efficacy of these vaccines. Now, the, uh, they have also handed in the information to the WHO to be able to have an emergency use listing for these vaccines. And once that has happened, then of course, SAGE will look at the uh, recommendations uh, for these vaccines to be included as part of the arsenal that we're using with the, with the others that have already been pre-qualified and approved for, for use. Um, the, the other issue in the, in, during the meeting that I would highlight is the situation of uh, the vaccination against measles and rubella. We're deeply worried that this has been stalled because of the COVID situation. And we fear that uh, if this is not uh, properly looked at by each one of the countries that has not been able to vaccinate the children so far, we will be having problems with outbreaks with, of, of especially measles. That is something that worries everybody and that we saw happening in 2019 in a very serious way. On April 26, during the World Immunization Link, we will be launching or the WHO will be launching the uh, IA2030, the program for the next 10 years on immunization, which includes as one of its main indicators, of course, the vaccination against measles. So we do hope that this is a call for action and that countries will be looking into how to catch up programs in the sense of vaccinating the children that have been left out. And of course, starting the routine immunization program for those that are now coming up on the way. I would leave it there unless uh, Kate and Joachim would like to add something that they consider should be part of this initial part of the report. Thank you. Yes. Um, let me very much first say thank you very much, uh, Professor Calviotto. We will share these uh, summaries, the highlights of this with the sound files and there should also already be on the web now. Um, it's available through the newsroom. We'll try to share uh, the link as soon as possible um, by email, but otherwise as of 12 o'clock, which is 15 minutes ago when we started the meeting, these recommendations, the summary uh, highlights uh, of that meeting should be up. The uh, full report, by the way, will be published in the weekly update from the epidemiological record as uh, usual, but on 4 June. So these summaries will be uh, of best use until then. Now let me ask Dr. O'Brien if there's anything to add or Dr. Homba. Nothing specific to add. I think um, we'll be eager to take questions and address those um, from the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then with this, we go to the first question on my list, and that would be Jamie Keaton from AP. Jamie, please unmute yourself. Good morning or good early afternoon to everyone. Um, I wanted to know if uh, Dr. Cardiato or Dr. O'Brien, if you could uh, speak a little bit more about the, um, the data that you're getting both from uh, the Chinese uh, manufacturers of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, um, Sinopharm and Sinovac, Sinovac and as well as the Russian about the data um, and also um, what kind of figures you have um, 
been able to compile on efficacy rates and uh, the level of manufacturing um, for the manufacturing capacity for, for those, for those uh, vaccines. Thank you so much. I guess I can start. Yes, please. As, as you well know, we have established since June of last year a very um, important working group that looks at all this information as it becomes available. Over the past months, these two companies from China have been presented their data to this working group, and they have been able to follow up what is becoming available and what they feel also should be clear to the company that needs to become available <coughs> excuse me, before the vaccines are recommended. Of course, we have a process that goes first through an, uh, an emergency use recommendation either by WHO or one of the, what we call the stringent regulatory authorities before we can make recommendations about the use of this vaccine, which is something that hasn't happened yet with these two products. The information that uh, the companies shared publicly at the meeting uh, last week clearly indicates that they have levels of efficacy that would be compatible with the requirement that WHO has asked for this vaccine, that means about 50% and preferably uh, close or above 70%. And of course, they have all the safety data to show that these vaccines would cause no harms in humans when used. I would like to add that many of these vaccines are already in use in many countries that have gone through their own regulatory process to approve them. So in that sense, we hope to accrue information also from the use of these vaccines, wherever they are being implemented, that would be complementary to the one that the company already has obtained during the clinical trials. For now, we have information that the vaccines are safe and that they're in the process of defining final, their, their final analysis to show the efficacy that will be uh, used for the uh, emergency use listing approval. And once that is in place, then we will be able to make the necessary recommendations for its use. Um, I don't know if Kate would like to add or do I think something to do? Yeah, I think the importance here is um, that we will, um, from a WHO perspective, we will, um, as, as Dr. Carviotto said, line this up um, fully with the emergency use listing as uh, procedures. As you know, those procedures um, involve a separate group of experts look at efficacy and safety, but also look at quality of manufacturing and from a SAGE perspective. So that really answers the question of if vaccines um, should be used and SAGE is really answering how they're used. The um, One of the things that really came out from the SAGE session, um, not specific to these um, two vaccines, but it's relevant to them, is that the um, degree of efficacy does vary according to the case definitions that are used for detecting and defining disease events. And that we um, really want to emphasize that making any comparisons between products is fraught with um, difficulty unless you're comparing the same case definition. And uh, it's clear from the clinical trials of all of the products that we don't have one consistent case definition that has been deployed in the clinical trial protocols. And so it's very difficult to make and should not be making um, comparisons between products for their top line efficacy results. Um, we really are looking at each product on its merits relative to the target product profile. Over. I can quickly add um, uh, one point. Um, we, the data sources that we um, are looking at uh, are obviously um, coming out of the file that is submitted for emergency use listing to WHO, so to say a regulatory file. Uh, and in addition, obviously, we have direct interactions with the company to format and to get additional information. When we will, and we are of course encouraging that uh, the results are being published and some of the uh, data from these companies have already been put out uh, in the peer reviewed literature. When we come to issuing um, um, the recommendations and we hope this will be by the end of April, but that is to be confirmed, 
we always put out what we call a background paper that you then can also find on the web that summarizes the, the evidence that we have taken into consideration to issue the recommendations. So this summary information will in any case be available um, as we have done it already for other vaccines uh, where we have issued recommendations. Thank you very much all for these explanations. Now we move to Helen Bransville from Stadt. Helen, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, can I just ask a quick follow-up to Jamie's question before I um, ask my main question? Is this the first time Chinese manufacturers have applied for an EUL through WHO? Kate, maybe you want to briefly take on Dr. Of your question. Well, I, I think I can quickly answer this. I think in relation to uh, emergency use listing, that is uh, that's indeed the first time. But there is WHO pre-qualified uh, vaccines out of China. The first actually vaccine that was pre-qualified um, coming out of China was a Japanese encephalitis vaccine a couple of years ago, and which is on the Gavi portfolio. Yeah, let me just add that the first EUL vaccine is the novel OPV vaccine, the NOPV vaccine, which was EUL'd in November, I think it was, if not early December of 2020. So that's the first vaccine that has gotten WHO EUL. Following that are the, um, the COVID vaccines. Um, and I think you have the list of which ones have made their way through uh, EUL processes at WHO. Okay, thanks. Um, my, my main question I, at this point, if I may come get back into line for another if I can, is um, you were talking off the top about the concerns about the possibility of measles outbreaks. Is there any concern about the security of measles vaccine supply in the current context where, you know, manufacturers are trying desperately to ramp up production of COVID vaccines? Is there any concern? that the measles uh, production capacity will be cannibalized in any, any way? So perhaps I can take that question. We're looking very carefully at actually all of the vaccines, including measles vaccines and the supply security around those vaccines. At this point, we do not expect that there will be shortages of the um, uh, vaccines in the essential immunization program. Um, <laughs> however, um, as uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity for COVID vaccines, and we all recognize that there's intense pressure to increase that capacity, as that ramps up, um, we have to continue watching this really carefully. We are starting to see the um, supply chain start to shrink to some degree, so that the amount of vaccine in the supply chain is narrowing, um, but we don't see in those analyses that that would lead to shortages anywhere at this point, but a very important area to continue watching carefully. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien. Let's move to the next question, and that would be Christiane Ulrich from DPA. Christiane, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Directed to whoever is the best uh, to answer this, um, Germany has changed their recommendation for the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine for COVID. Um, are you afraid that these back and forth uh, uh, changes of regulations and recommendations will, will uh, harm the reputation of that vaccine? Or would you say this is a... German case that should not have any influence on anyone else's decision on whether to use this vaccine or not. Thank you. Let me ask Dr. O'Brien to start and then maybe if Professor Kadiota wants to chip in. Yeah, WHO uh, has obviously recommendations on um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, both from a safety perspective, um, from a, a use perspective. Um, we are monitoring um, and participating in the reviews of safety evidence um, uh, as we've described and, and uh, the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety is um, 
continuing to review that vaccine and all the vaccines that are um, being deployed through a number of means. I think what's most important here is that um, the WHO recommendations and the review are fully understood to support decisions that any country makes. And the countries are responsible for their own specific context. Um, and especially in this um, remit of the COVID vaccines where different countries have um, a portfolio of one or more vaccines that they have availability for, that the pandemic is at uh, a phase in countries um, with a, a burden of disease and, uh, and control measures otherwise apart from vaccines, that each country does have to chart a course about how they will use the products that are in their remit and available to them. But what we are clear on is that the benefit risk assessment for the AstraZeneca vaccine um, given the range of evidence on both um, uh, efficacy, effectiveness, uh, safety, and quality manufacturing, that it still weighs very heavily in favor of the use of the vaccine. It is a safe vaccine, and as expected, um, with uh, the broad use of this and, frankly, any other vaccine, that we uh, anticipate that there might have been rare uh, events that would be identified um, that may be associated with, with uh, the vaccine. So we do, uh, we, we really want to emphasize the importance of the safety network, the safety structure is doing the job that it was intended to do, identifying signals, tracking down those signals about whether they seem to be related to the vaccine or um, coincidental with vaccine use, and then providing information, especially to healthcare providers um, about anything that uh, they should be alert to um, in the deployment of these vaccines, recognizing that the pandemic is um, taking the lives of uh, many more people um, than it, it should be taking the lives of, and especially as we have vaccines that um, are providing protection against severe disease, protection against death, we're now starting to see evidence um, important evidence around the ability of these vaccines to also protect against infection, um, that that weighting of the benefit of the vaccines, the risk uh, or the potential risk of vaccines um, is the important sort of assessment that is done. And that as evidence continues to roll in, um, we will continue to update recommendations to be responsive to that evidence. So when, a, when an individual country tries to optimize um, what's in the portfolio of their uh, access to vaccines, um, that, that's something that WHO fully recognizes is what countries should be doing. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien. And let me ask Professor Gaviotto to add. I would <clears throat> just add to what Kate said, that what we have asked every country is to have a system in place to be able to detect these problems. If, we're using the, if you're using the vaccine, then there should be a system in place to be able to follow up any of these adverse effects. And so the idea of bringing them up publicly is precisely so that everybody's aware that these are signals that have to be clearly looked for in any case for any use of the vaccine. In many countries where the AstraZeneca vaccine is being used, these systems are in place and they don't seem to be reporting back any of these other issues. So we feel comfortable that at least the systems are detecting the problems and that everybody's being made aware of them. Thank you. Thank you very much both. And now we go to the next one. That is Mariela Shkurta from Syri Television, Albania. Mariela, please unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Here we go. We hear you. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding the Corona vac vaccine that is produced by China. Albania has received recently more than 190,000 doses of Corona vac and is expected to receive more within weeks. The first shipment is being massively administrated on people over the age of 70. Do you have any data of the effectiveness of Corona vac? And do you suggest this vaccine? for the elderly people, keeping in mind the side effects that this vaccine might have for people over the age of 60. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Mariela. And we'll do the same again. I'll ask Dr. O'Brien to start and then possibly Professor Kazuto to add. So SAGE has not made any recommendations yet on the corona vac vaccine. Um, uh, we had the information session, so we did review um, evidence on CoronaVac from the immunogenicity and from the efficacy trials. And the working group is continuing to deliberate on that evidence and will come forward to SAGE with um, options on recommendations in due course. So we won't comment at this point on um, specific recommendations because SAGE has not um, gotten to that point in, uh, in the development of the, of the um, review of the evidence. I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Cravioto in case you want to say anything further about what was reviewed at SAGE or, or anything else you'd like to add on, on where SAGE is at with this recommendation. I, I think you're him. Uh, yeah, I think um, actually take you summed it up um, quite well. I mean, we know that um, the data in older people above 60 are limited and we are reviewing the situation. We also know that the vaccine is being used already in a number of countries. So one thing we are also looking into whether there is any uh, data already emerging from countries that are using the vaccine in relation to effectiveness in older age populations. So, I mean, we are, we are in process of piling all this um, information together, um, but um, we haven't uh, made any recommendation yet. But um, on the other hand side, we also can say that the vaccine is safe in, in all uh, the population groups that have been studied. Thank you very much for these clarifications. Let's move to Ashwin Barsingje from the Observer Times in India. Ashwin, please unmute yourself. Thank you for, hello. We hear you. Thank you for consideration for my questions. Uh, is it WHO around the globe and science? I think we lost you. Can you try again that question? Around the globe is what I heard, and then it got cut off. So as we don't hear anything from you, uh, I'll give you another chance in a moment. Uh, so I don't know if you hear us, but uh, let's for now go to Lisa Schlein from Voice of America. Lisa, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, Christian, nice to see you. I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, first on uh, the AstraZeneca uh, situation, uh, are you concerned that the actions like uh, Germany, what Germany is doing right now, might discourage countries, other countries, from using AstraZeneca. That seems to be happening. And I'm thinking most particularly about the situation in Africa where this uh, has been touted as a kind of ideal vaccine for the continent because I believe it's one dose and it's quite cheap. And I'm wondering whether o COVAX is dis continuing to distribute this in Africa, and if there's been any hesitancy on the part of nations there to accept it. And then a second question has to do with, uh, it's actually a follow-up to what Jamie asked a long time ago. He asked you about the situation of the Russian Sputnik vaccine, and, and I'm, um, I'm really curious about that because I haven't heard anything about uh, it going through the pre WHO pre-qualification process. Has it actually uh, begun? And are you investigating the situation? I mean, what do you know about its efficacy, whether its safety, whether it is safe, it is being used? Thank you. Thank you, Aunt Lisa, and I'll hand to Dr. O'Brien. Thanks. So. Um, uh, let me start with the last question first, that's um, uh, on the Sputnik vaccine. So we do have a publicly available um, document, a spreadsheet that shows each of the vaccines um, and what stage they're at with respect to EUL. Uh, I don't know if we can put that in the chat, but if not, we can provide that link uh, to you uh, after the press conference. So you can follow that um, on 
at any time. It's updated on a real-time basis or a, at a minimum on a weekly basis of the stage that each vaccine is at. So with respect to the Sputnik vaccine, um, the, there is uh, engagement with WHO on the EUL process. They are continuing to provide data. And of course, the EUL process can only go as fast as um, the information that manufacturers provide to WHO, uh, which is then reviewed and uh, discussions are had about um, what potentially additional information is needed. So there are data packages as well, how we refer to it, data packages that are um, have been and continue to be um, provided to WHO and uh, um, work going on with um, the manufacturer to move through the EUL process, including um, scheduling a time for when um, the uh, uh, review of the manufacturing facility um, would take place. So I'll refute, refer you to the spreadsheet around that specific um, timing. Um, the question about then the, um, I want to just clarify a couple of things. So the COVAX facility has a number of vaccines in the facility. It includes the AstraZeneca product from two manufacturers, the Serum Institute of India, as well as SK Bio in Korea. Um, also includes the Pfizer vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson or the Janssen vaccine, which is the one dose vaccine. The other vaccines are two dose vaccines. Um, and uh, a deal with Novavax um, as we will uh, proceed with um, both EUL and SAGE recommendations on the Novavax vaccine. Um, and there are ongoing negotiations and discussions with additional manufacturers for deals on additional products. So the COVAX facility is not a static um, set of products. It is an ongoing portfolio of products that continues to develop. So the, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is a two-dose vaccine. Um, it does have the advantage of being outside of a ultra cold chain or outside of a frozen cold chain, so um, a, a refrigerated product. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is the one-dose vaccine, and that, of course, in not just in low-income settings, but in all settings, has an advantage as a one-dose product. Um, also a refrigerated um, product, which facilitates um, some of the delivery characteristics. The, um, these are um, safe, effective products. There is high demand for vaccine, these vaccines, um, and this includes um, countries around the world uh, that are using these vaccines. The, um, the uh, concern uh, for countries about um, preference around products um, is really about uh, their ability to deploy products that have different delivery characteristics. Um, and at this point, um, the major source of uh, vaccine is the AstraZeneca vaccine. And what we're seeing from countries, remember there are over 190 countries or economies that are in the COVAX facility, high demand um, for the AstraZeneca product and deploying that product. Um, we do have some concerns about the pace of availability, supply availability. Um, most countries are struggling with this. Virtually all countries are struggling with the pace of supply um, and the projections that were made by manufacturers around the pace of supply. So um, I think that uh, addresses the three questions that you had around the different products. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien. I understand the link of the spreadsheet mentioned will come up in the chat any moment. Um, do we have uh, Joachim uh, Hombach to add, please? I actually put already the link into the chat. Um, no, not much to add. I think uh, just to say that the SAGE working group um, that reviews all the evidences on which basis SAGE makes its recommendation has been, is already in contact with Gamalea. Um, they have, by the way, published um, much of their data. We will be going hand in hand synchronized with the emergency use listing process in order to issue our recommendations. But the process on our side has been initiated. Thank you again for the clarification. Now let us move to, oh yeah, back to Ashwin again. Let's try Ashwin Basinger from Observer Time, Times India again. Ashwin, please try again. Uh, thank you. Uh, I got some uh, internet connection problem. Uh, is it 
WHO and scientists around the globe identified virus host dynamic, which is important in development of safe and efficacious vaccines. And is the virus host dynamic varies in SARS CO2 variants of concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwinga and Dr. O'Brien, please. Yeah, actually, could I just ask, it came in and out for me a little bit. I'm sorry to ask for a repeat, but could, could you just repeat the question so I'm, I'm clear what you're asking? We'll, we'll get that yeah, uh, question uh, asked eventually. Please come again, yeah. Sure, sure. Now it cut again. Ashwin, yeah, I'll ask another participant, uh, another journalist to ask, maybe if you can do have access. Send it in writing. Uh, send it exactly. Send it in writing, and if possible, either in the chat or in where it can be put, and we'll take it from there. So uh, we'll go to the next question we have online. And can I ask, every, remind everyone else, if you still want to put your hand up for question, there's still time to do. Um, now the next one on my list is Valeria Roman from Info by Valeria. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, hello. Uh uh, my question is, um, could um, the, the efficacy of Sputnik and Sinopharm vaccines are the same if you consider the new variants, of, the, the variants of UK, the Manaus variant and the California variant? Dr. O'Brien? Yeah, I can address that. So um, there are three variants of concern that have been specified by WHO. Um, there are also a group of variants of interest uh, that we are following. And um, for each of the vaccines and for each of the variants, um, we would want to have from a policy perspective specific information on the performance of those vaccines against the variant. Unfortunately, that's not the world of evidence that we're living in right now. Um, there is uh, little to no information about the use of, or the uh, impact of um, some of the vaccines and specifically the ones that you mentioned, um, uh, limit, very limited to no evidence on some of the variants that you've described. Um, so what SAGE is really calling for is the research community and the public health community to um, generate evidence and the manufacturers to do the research that is needed in order to understand the performance of these vaccines against each of the variants of concern. For the three variants of concern, they each are more transmissible um, so they are uh, transmitting from one person to the next more frequently than the non-variants. There is very little evidence um, to suggest that there's more severe disease as a result of the variants. And the performance of the vaccines against these variants is really a set of evidence that is starting to grow and starting to build. But in general, and I won't speak about each product and each variant specifically, but in general, we are seeing that for these three variants, the vaccines tend to have somewhat lower performance, but still substantial protection against disease. We also know that for each of the vaccines, the performance of the vaccines against the more severe end of the spectrum of disease is stronger than the performance against either infection or mild disease. Um, so uh, uh, we don't have specific information for some of the variants and some of the vaccines that you described. It's very much uh, an area that is um, uh, under evaluation um, and evidence is continuing to roll out. Thank you very much uh, for this important one. Now we have let me see, Shoko um, from NHK Japan. Shoko, please unmute yourself. Hi, Kristen, can you hear me? 
Very well, go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Dr. Wilda Smith mentioned during the last press briefing on 17th March that Johnson & Johnson vaccine is halal. May I ask um, how uh, SAGE evaluates other COVID-19 vaccines which are already in the emergency use listing, if whether it's halal or not? Thank you. So there was a bit of background noise, but I understand there's a summary how SAGE or if SAGE is evaluated evaluating the halal recommendations and similar of all vaccines, right? Okay, uh, let me ask Professor Xavier first. If I understand correctly, that would be the follow-up that we do after we make the recommendations. Yes, of course, we're following them up. And also we are trying to incorporate all new information that comes up from uh, the follow-up of the use of this vaccine into how these recommendations are working or whether they need an update. And that is a process that we're already looking into because uh, we want to keep them um, totally in line with what is known at, at the time. So in, in that sense, the follow-up for each one of these vaccines is important in the sense of uh, how the use and the rollout is happening. And the more that they are used, of course, the more that we realize exactly what is the performance in, in, in reality, that's, that's what we call effectiveness studies in difference to efficacy ones, which are the ones that come up from the clinical trials. We will be updating our uh, recommendations when needed. And when these, uh, these uh, updates really make a difference to what we have already recommended about the use of, this, of these products. So far, um, what we are trying also is to harmonize uh, the way that these vaccines have been recommended since the knowledge we had when we recommended the first ones is different to the one we have now in, in that sense. So um, I think that would answer your question unless there was something else that I didn't really understand or if Kate and Joachim would like to add something. Dr. Carbioto, mm -hmm. I think what she was asking about was halal, not exactly. follow-up. Oh, I think, I think you misunderstood. <laughs> I think you misheard oh. the question. I think she was asking about it. whether the vaccines yes. are halal. Uh, yes, they're totally halal. There's no, uh, there are no, no animal components in the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and also there's no fetal tissue in the vaccine. So it's perfectly useful to to use for people who have concerns about that. And in fact, it is interesting because the commentary coming out of of uh, a group of Catholic bishops was totally denied by the Vatican itself about. Uh, the, the uh, safety in the sense of the vaccine not having any type of fetal products that could interfere with its use for the people who are highly religious or the presence of animal products for those that follow the halal process. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much, Professor Grovioto, for this clarification. Um, I am trying to find if we have the question from Ashwin online somewhere here on the on the chat or on the box i don't see it um, so should we try one more time to connect them if not we are through with the questions i asked the technical side to see if we can have ashwin connected if not then we'll stop it down all right so then we are through with our questions but i understand that we have also online with us or at least the listening in is uh, dr aiden o'leary he's the director of who polio eradication so, Dr. O'Leary, I'll ask you maybe for a quick uh, statement on, on the polio side of the SAGE campaigns. Over to you. Do we have Dr. O'Leary connected? Yes. So, uh, thank you very much, Christian, and uh, our thanks to Professor Krabioto and Kate for the very comprehensive briefs. I think maybe just two points on uh, the polio side. One is to uh, acknowledge the, the major impact that uh, the COVID pandemic has had on ongoing operations through 2020 into early 2021. Uh, but our, what we have seen over the course of the, the past number of months is a significant uptick in the resumption of campaigns, uh, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan, which are the two endemic countries, as well as uh, across the African region and in the Eastern Mediterranean as we respond to circulating vaccine-derived polio outbreaks. 
So um, as uh, I think uh, Professor Cravioto had highlighted, uh, there has been a commitment from the Polio Oversight Board to support pandemics or uh, response in all the countries in which we are uh, polio assets and resources are engaged. And that will continue uh, to support the our COVID vaccine introduction and delivery uh, through 2021 and beyond. And then I think the, the second point uh, was simply to uh, highlight uh, the ongoing work in relation to novel uh, OPV2 uh, uh, rollout, which I think Kate has highlighted was the very first vaccine that received the emergency use listing uh, or, uh, from WHO in late November uh, 2020. Uh, what we have is a very extensive effort uh, as uh, upwards of 40 countries uh, prepare uh, to meet the, the different requirements uh, to support the safe rollout of this vaccine. Uh, we've had two countries, uh, Nigeria and Liberia, where the initial campaigns uh, have been uh, are, are conducted. Uh, you know, we've uh, received very, very positive results to date. And what we do hope uh, as we work through the uh, progression from initial use to more wider use, that we will be able to work very closely with the Vaccine Control Safety Committee, as well as with SAGE to make sure that uh, we are able to safely move from uh, that initial use to wider use, hopefully during the course of the third quarter of this year. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is the uh, advice and guidance that has been received by SAGE, uh, where we uh, encourage all countries at risk of CVTPV outbreaks to begin their readiness and preparations uh, sooner rather than later. But in the event of detections uh, that or we do proceed with the existing vaccines to make sure that we have as an effective and uh, efficient response to protect as many children as are possible as quickly as we possibly can. So we very much appreciate the, uh, the work of Professor Crevioto and his team, uh, which have been very supportive and uh, have been uh, kind of very, very clear in terms of how we actually proceed as safely and uh, efficiently as we possibly can. I'll stop there. Back to you, Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aidan O'Leary, Director of Polio Eradication Program at WHO for this uh, important summary. Thank you. Um, with this, we come to the end of the questions and answers session. I have no more hands up and I'll ask Dr. Kate O'Brien uh, for some final words before we have Professor Fabio to close. Yes, um, so two things that I want to mention as, as we go into closing. Um, the first is that World Immunization Week is April 24th to 30th this year with a theme of vaccines um, bring us closer. Um, and uh, we very much hope that you will be alert to World Immunization Week. If this is not the week um, when the world's attention is on immunization, um, I, I think um, we have uh, missed, missed a mark as um, both uh, communicators, um, media scientists, public health professionals. The second is that we have the Immunization Agenda 2030, which is the world's um, global strategy for this decade, which will launch um, during World Immunization Week on April the 26th. And that is the multi-partner, every country um, strategy uh, for the, the decade of vaccine progress. And clearly the world that we're living in right now is one where vaccines are front and center. Issues of equity are front and center. Issues of manufacturing, of vaccine deployment, of vaccine safety, the impact of vaccines and the life-saving nature of them. Um, and so I would um, just like to draw your attention to both of those things as we close, because this is the period of acceleration impact um, where every, everyone everywhere at every age should have the full benefit of vaccines for good health and, well, and well-being. And I'll turn over um, to Alejandro uh, to just uh, any last words from him from a SAGE perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Very little to add after that. <clears throat> I would just add two things. One is the uh, um, the thanks that everybody should have for the people who carry on the vaccinations everywhere. Uh, these new outbreaks of Ebola in, in Africa uh, indicate the need again to put people in danger to be able to take the vaccines where they're needed. And I think our thanks worldwide should be with all those groups who really do the work in the field 
using the products that we recommend. On the other hand, I would like to thank again all the people who are involved with SAGE in reviewing information, our working groups, and especially the COVID-19 working group that has been set up that meets three times a week, that has a whole time to review uh, uh, information, be able to come up with recommendations. And of course, the secretariat behind it with Joachim and his, his people who are the ones who allow us to do the work. This is a joint effort by everybody, and we hope we're doing it at the speed and at the need that is required so that we can have these vaccines in place to be able to curb the terrible problem that we have all been going through. In the meantime, what we would also like to stress is that all the other measures to keep people safe, the wearing of masks, the washing of hands, and the social distancing have to be kept in place whether people are being vaccinated or not so that we can get rid or stop the circulation of this virus, which is really causing havoc in our world. I would like to thank everybody on behalf of SAGE and hope that we will meet soon with more recommendations about other products that are useful to keep us alive and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, all, Dr. Hombach, Dr. Kate O'Brien, um, but of course, uh, Professor Alejandro Gavioto, very important and good words at the end. And also let me thank Dr. Aidan O'Leary, Director of Polio Eradication Program. Um, I've, we've put the link to the highlights from the meeting of, this, of the SAGE already here into the chat, but we'll send the points and the link also out again with the audio files of this briefing as soon as possible afterwards. And with this, thank you all very much for participating. Have a good day and um, hopefully a good uh, few days off. Good day. Thanks, Chris.